Hello and welcome to this edition of Consciousness Raising Online. Thank you, Clyde. Good to see you, as always. And uh, anybody else who's listening to this while we're live, feel free to uh, let me know. You can text in and let me know, and I'll acknowledge you. Um, this Today's presentation, uh, let me put it like this. I'm willing to bet that most of us have never heard of all three of these massacres. And I'm talking about massacres of black people here in the United States. And the other part of the title about the Supreme Court. See, it's so important who's on that Supreme Court. And right now, in 2018, when this is being recorded, there is a transition actually occurring on the Supreme Court that's going to affect us for the next two, maybe three generations. And it's not a good thing. And I think that when you hear this information today, you'll come to understand even more how important the, 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 the Supreme Court's decisions are when it comes to black people and how that's affected us in the past. Now, this map that's up here, I want to take a minute just to look at it close for a second because uh, look, at it, look at it this way. Okay, notable incidents of racist violence between emancipation, which is considered to be 1865 at the end of the Civil War, in 1900, okay? And you see where it says birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, Pulaski, uh, Tennessee, uh, roughly 1865, 1866, uh, Wilmington, Delaware, over on the right, or Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, which I've done a, a piece on in the past about how they literally, that was a, a, a coup d'etat where they literally, white people just literally uh, killed the black people that who were the elected officials and ran the rest out of town and took over. Uh, and there's quite a few others in here. Um, but I'm going to focus on three in particular that you may or may not have heard of and where I'm talking about huge massacres and no body was ever truly uh, prosecuted for that, okay? Um, and down at the bottom, I'm going to take a quick note of this. It says, in 1893, almost 30 years after emancipation, blacks in the South were being murdered at a rate of at least one every 40 hours, every day and a half or whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's important for us to understand because of this. After the Civil War, there was a period called Reconstruction. In fact, the nickname was Radical Reconstruction. And the, 
belief, the general belief by many people, is that um, well, it was it was it was uh, an interesting time. Well, let me put it like this: Black people came out of the war, the Civil War, like forty going north. Meaning this: We uh, immediately started uh, building schools, opening businesses, uh, buying property getting elected to office both local, uh, statewide, and uh, uh, also uh, just, oh, oh, patents, getting patents for inventions. We were doing it so tough, and I say this a lot of times, people think I'm joking, but what happened was most white people assumed that since we were not allowed to learn how to read during slavery, that it would take us many years to uh, get enough schools and, and educate enough of us to get a, a majority of us being able to read and write, etc. But what happened was immediately after the emancipation, black people started popping up that could read just as well and write. And it was because a lot more, quote, uh, 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 Africans who were enslaved learned how to read and write anyway. We just didn't tell Massa, and so as soon as we, as soon as the door was open, we ran through it, and it was so bad that the uh, the former slave owners and and folks in the South went to the folks in the North in the union and the government and said, hey, look, uh, we got to stop these black people, these Africans, because if we don't, they will own the South in a few years. Understand how deep this is. We had gotten more land, open businesses by the time, uh, uh, open schools. We were doing amazing. Now, understand, Radical Reconstruction only lasted 12 years, from 1865 to 1877. And that's when, by that time, they had convinced the North and the federal government to uh, stop protecting us. And if you look at those dates, you see where these dates are from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 1866 up to as late as 1887 down there in Thibodeau, um, they were, they immediately, see this is the thing, the pushback began immediately after the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, why is this important? It's important because we went to work we went to work uh, to, to make our lives better. And the former slave owners and slave, uh, uh, the people, who, the white people who worked in the slave industry, they started doing vicious things to us. We started trying to get the right to vote and all these things, and they were pushing back crazy. Now, how were we being protected? We were being protected by Union soldiers who were sent down south to the various areas to protect the black people because they couldn't they couldn't have the slave former slave owners and the people who worked on the slave plantations, the overseers and people like that. They couldn't have them protect us. They weren't going to protect us. And as the map shows, they didn't protect us. In fact, they fought us like crazy. And they didn't just fight with sticks. They were murdering us. Murdering us. Okay? So now, here we go. In 1866, in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm going to start with that one. Okay? The Memphis Massacre of 1866 was a series 
of violent events that occurred from May 1st to May 3rd, 1866 in Memphis. Now this violence was ignited by political, social, and racial tensions following the, the Civil War in the early stages of Reconstruction. Understand, remember, uh, the war was over in 1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1865. This started in May of eight, in 1866. What had occurred was that, um, understand what was going on in Memphis, for an example, you had white policemen, but you also had black soldiers. Um, and black soldiers were there as part of the, because these were black union soldiers. And so after the war, they were part of the force that the government sent down south or had down south to help protect black people. But there was an ongoing battle between the white police and the black union soldiers as to who was running stuff. Now, here's the part you almost never read about. When we say white police, one of the things that occurred in Memphis, and this happened a few other places, but especially in Memphis, the majority of the white police were Irish. And this is important to understand because the Irish had been discriminated against. They weren't enslaved, as some of them try to say now, but they were discriminated against. But they managed to not only become the majority of the police department, but also of the government. They were the mayors and, 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 and people who worked in the, gov the city government. And this happened not just here, not just in Memphis, but also in my hometown of Chicago. And it happened because they, they were the closest to English, to speaking English and writing English. See, the Italians and the Polish, people like that, they didn't speak English as well as the British, of course, but the Irish were close. And so they were able to get in and get those positions. So there was an ongoing battle between these white Irish police and black soldiers. And when they, when they mustered out the black soldiers, mustering mean that they were um, released from serving in the military, uh, there was more and more pushback between them. Finally, what happened was that, uh, you know, the, mil the U.S. Army used these black soldiers to, bet to patrol Memphis, and um, they also protected the Freedmen's Bureau, which the white people, they hated this. They hated the Freedmen's Bureau. So there were plenty of incidents between them uh, who were fighting. Um, now, the police, these Irish police, would many times arrest black soldiers, you know, for minor offenses. Now, remember, the black soldiers were supposed to be there to, to keep order, right? But they gave these white Irish <coughs> police, <coughs> excuse me, jurisdiction over these black soldiers. And they, of course, would get treated brutally when they were arrested by these white police. And uh, they were also uh, mistreating the, the free black people. Finally, on, in September of 1865, the uh, brigadier general, who was a white guy, he banned the public entertainments, balls, and parties frequently given by the colored people of this city. And again, things that just are right now. Here in Chicago, the police department not that long ago said that they were going to stop the, what they call, unpermitted 
block parties. Um, in some areas, some, some neighborhoods, in fact, all across the city, uh, people will have block parties where they block off their street, have uh, entertainment and food and, and music and dance and everything, and they just party. In some cases, they'll get a permit. In some cases, they don't. Um, and it's been, do been done for years. But since they can't figure out how to deal with the violence that's jumping off the shooting in certain neighborhoods, and understand, you'll hear this term a lot, that ch Chicago's a war zone. Chicago is not a war zone. There are some neighborhoods that are under siege, but Chicago is not a war zone. Okay? Most of the communities and neighborhoods in Chicago do not have a, a huge violence shooting problem. It's just certain neighborhoods and even that suspect. But when you hear somebody say Chicago's a war zone, those are people who obviously don't know what a war zone is. So I would say, ask a veteran, ask a brother who's been to Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam, what a war zone looks like. And you will realize that Chicago is not a war zone. But anyway, they said they, the police department decided they were going to they told they said they were going to stop these unpermitted war zones. I mean, uh, block parties. They did that in Memphis, and so the police then would intervene at these black gatherings and uh, uh, break them up. They tried to do it at one particular occasion and tried to arrest a group of women on grounds of prostitution. The problem was. The women they were trying to arrest were wives of the, the soldiers. So they ended up with uh, uh, the soldiers end up preventing the arrest and uh, an armed standoff uh, occurred. Um, the police were shoving and beating black people in the street for the social crime of, quote, insolence. That's when black folks said, what are you doing? You can't do this. And they would beat, beat, beat black folks up, which is a problem we still have with police overdoing their duties. On May 1st, 1866, a large group of black soldiers, women, and children gathered in a public space forming an impromptu street party. Okay? At about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the city recorder, John Creighton, ordered four police to break up the party. The police obeyed, although the area was outside of their jurisdiction and Creighton was outside of their chain of command. He was the city recorder. And the soldiers refused to disperse. The four police retreated and called for reinforcements. The soldiers chased them away and gunfire broke out. One of the police shot himself accidentally uh, while he was pulling out his firearm. And of course, they turned around and blamed it on the black soldiers. And so that precipitated the riot. Uh, now, the riot jumped off because the, the city police and other white men assembled to engage the black soldiers. Some of the soldiers were shot and killed early in the evening, including some who were fleeing and wounded. And uh, General George Stoneman asked to use military force, was asked to use mil military force to restore order. He refused and suggested that the sheriff create a posse. So they uh, ended up patrolling Memphis. This is still May 1st. And by 11, 12 o'clock midnight, most of the black soldiers had, had retreated and gone to home, gone to bed. Now, finding no soldiers in the late evening, the white mob that had formed then turned to attack various black homes, looting and assaulting the people. When I say looting and assaulting, they attacked houses, schools, churches, burned many of them as well as attacking the black folks, killing uh, quite a few. Um, 
And they even raped women, black women. And uh, they were just, just, now this was the second day. No, this is the end of the first day. Uh, again, that city recorder incited a white crowd to arm themselves and go after the blacks and drive them out of the city. And so they went on the wild. Uh, burning and looting and shooting and killing and raping. And they ended up over the next two days uh, running out a lot of the black people who lived there, as well as killing a bunch. Now, supposedly, they end up with the toll being uh, 46 black people killed, two whites. 75 black people injured, over five, over 100 black people were robbed, five black women were raped, 91 homes, four churches, and eight schools were burned in the black community. And they reduced the black population by over 25%. That was Memphis, 1866. And after denying that it happened for many, many years, uh, the NAACP, I believe it was, put up, uh, put up uh, a marker. So I'll leave it up for a minute so we can read it. 1866 Memphis Massacre on May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1866, mobs of white men led by law enforcement attacked black people in the areas near South Street, etc., by the end of the attack, the mobs had killed an estimated 46 black people, raped several black women, and committed numerous robberies, assaults, and arsons. A congressional investigative committee reported that four churches, 12 schools, and 91 other dwellings were burned. Although no one was ever prosecuted for this massacre, it became a rallying cry in the battle over the nation's reconstruction following the Civil War. Ultimately, the outrage that followed the massacre helped to ensure the adoption of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. And we know that that didn't help, okay? All right, now, that was May of 1866 in Memphis. Dig this. Um, a few months later, down in New Orleans, in fact, it was a couple of months, it was July. A Ju in July of 1866, there was the, the New Orleans Massacre. And this occurred July 30th. Now let me let me explain something real quick so that, that there's no confusion. After the after the Civil War, the there were still basically two parties. There was the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but they were the exact opposite of what they are today. The Republican Party was more more liberal and um, liberal and more towards what black people were about than the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was the one that was the racist party. I know it's weird to say that, but I want it to be understood so that there's no confusion later because one of the things the Russians did and the right wing did in the last election here in 2016 was they uh, they pretended like the Democratic Party was still the racist party and the Republican Party was the one that was for black people. That's not true. The Republican Party was the liberal party and black people gravitated towards that one uh, because they weren't allowed to be a part of the Democratic Party. Now, we get down to the 1960s, 
the 1960s. And what happened was black people in the South had challenged the Democratic Party at the conventions to, for their seats, for the seats of representation. And they were able to force that on the Democratic Party. Well, the racist whites in the Democratic Party, they left the Democratic Party. They called them Dixiecrats, as a matter of fact. They left the Democratic Party and went over to the Republican Party. And the Republican Party became even more racist. You see? So it wasn't that the Republicans loved black people. <laughs> okay? So now what was going on in New Orleans, they had um, a constitutional convention and the Republican Party had called for the convention because the, the party in control, the Democratic Party, had enacted the black codes and were refusing to give black men the, the vote. And so they, the Republicans uh, called for this constitutional convention in Louisiana. The Democrats considered this reconvened convention to be illegal. So again, political, social, and economic reasons jumped up in the face of the white folks and they got they didn't just get angry. They went on on the wow. The state constitution, constitutional convention in 1864 authorized greater civil freedoms to blacks within Louisiana. It did not give them the right to vote. Now, in Louisiana, they had a, a group of people called the free people of color. They were mixed race. And they had been a part of New Orleans for more than a century and were an established separate class in the colonial period. Um, in fact, they called them uh, mulattoes and, and different things like that. That's where you get the mulattoes and the, they had all kinds of names. Also, there were, um, oh, shoot, it's a word, um, that definitely designates who these people were. Because many of them were educated, they owned property, and uh, they wanted, the, they wanted the, the right to vote. So the, the, the Republicans then uh, were going along with that. They said, cool. So they reconvened, reconvened the convention and succeeded in eliminating the black codes in Louisiana and extending the vote to black men. On July 27th, the black supporters of the convention, including approximately 200 black war veterans, met on the steps of the Mechanics Institute. You'll see a, a graphic of that coming up in a minute. And they listened to speeches by the former governor and people who were right on with this. Okay, and they decided to have a parade uh, to the Mechanics Institute on the day of the convention to show their support. Now they met at the convention met at noon, July thirtieth, but a lack of a quorum caused a postponement till one thirty. When the convention members left the building, they were met by the black marchers with their marching band. And so they started marching to the Mechanics Institute. Across from the Institute was a group of armed whites waiting for them. And this is uh, Democrats who opposed abolition of slavery, ex-Confederates who wanted to disrupt the convention and who wanted to make black folks go backwards. Now, suppose it's not known who fired first, but within minutes, there was a battle going on in the streets. Most of the black marchers were unarmed, and they basically split. 
Some of them went up in the Mechanics Institute. The mob attacked the black folks in the street and then they went into the Mechanics Building. Listen to what they did. The whites stomped, kicked, and clubbed the black marchers mercilessly. Policemen smashed the Institute's windows and fired into it indiscriminately until the floor grew slick with blood. They emptied their revolvers on the convention delegates. Some of the delegates leaped from the windows and were shot dead when they hit the ground. Those lying on the ground were stabbed repeatedly, their skulls bashed in with brick bats, and when some of them kneeled and prayed for mercy, they were killed instantly and dead bodies were stabbed and mutilated. I wanted you to hear this because you need to understand how brutal the, the what they did to, to stop us, there's the Mechanics Institute, to stop us from what the war had been about. They were trying to keep slavery going. Look at this, this is a headline, Anarchy and Bloodshed in New Orleans. Uh, mobbing of the Constitutional Convention. Okay, I want to see another one. All right, let's look at this close up. All right, let's see. All right, it says, uh, up at the top, part of it says, and it was saying that some of the, some of the black folks had tried to escape from the burning building. That was the, the, the uh, Mechanics Institute. The unfortunate colored men were literally roasted alive in the sight of their enemies. Of all the whites who were engaged in the fight, there were only two or three who were killed or wounded, owing to the fact that very few of the Negroes were in possession of arms or weapons. The details of this sanguinary riot was, are quite shocking and the news had created intense excitement throughout the city. It is understood that the United States authorities intend making a thorough investigation into the affair for the purpose of securing the punishment of the guilty parties, whoever they may be. The war between the races so constantly carried on in this distracted state had seldom presented such a horrifying instance as this burning of a courthouse filled with human beings. It is scarcely credible, but the news is unfortunately too true for the reputation of our people. And look at this right here carefully. 300 Negroes burned or shot as they escaped from a burning courthouse. All right, now, uh, one more. Oh, I want you to see the book cover. Because it's not that it wasn't documented, but it was documented so poorly. This is one book called An Absolute Massacre, The New Orleans Race Riot. See, white people like to call them race riots. There wasn't no race riot, it was a massacre of July 30th, 1866. All right, the third one, and this is where we'll also get to the Supreme Court position. That was the last two were in 1866. Now we come to 1873. Remember I said the, 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 the uh, emancipation, the, the, the uh, uh, reconstruction, lasted from 1865 to 1877, 12 years. The Colfax Massacre, and the Colfax is in Louisiana. The Colfax Massacre occurred on April 13, 1873. The Battle Turn Massacre took place in a small town of Colfax, Louisiana as a clash between blacks and whites. Three whites and an estimated 150 blacks 
died in the conflict. The massacre took place against the backdrop of racial tensions following the hotly contested Louisiana governor's race of 1872. While the Republicans narrowly won the contest and retained control of the state, remember Republicans, right? White Democrats, angry over defeat, vowed revenge. In Colfax Parish County, as in other areas of the state, they organized a white militia to directly challenge the mostly black state militia under the control of the governor. Now, Colfax Parish reflected the political and racial divide in Louisiana. Um, it's now in 1872 election, there were 4,600 voters, approximately 2,400 mostly black Republican voters and 2,200 white Democratic voters. So the black, the, the, the Republican voters outnumbered the white Democratic voters. Um, so they were, they were, the white folks were mad about that. But one in particular incident basically touched off the Colfax massacre. On March 28th, local white Democratic leaders called for armed supporters to help them take the Colfax Parish Courthouse from the black and white Republican office holders on April 1st. Understand what they said. They said, we're going to take the courthouse back. We're going to take the courthouse and run the duly elected officials out. The Republicans responded by urging their mostly black supporters to defend them. Although nothing happened on April 1st, the next day fighting erupted between the two groups. On April 13th, Easter Sunday, more than 300 armed white men, including members of organizations such as the Knights of White Camellia and the Ku Klux Klan, attacked the courthouse building. They even got a cannon and fired the cannon on the courthouse. And so there were about 60 to 70 black uh, defenders, and they split. Some of them uh, surrendered. Um, one of the leaders of the attack, one of the, the, the Democratic uh, Klansmen or Knights of the White Camellia, he accidentally was shot by one of his own men. And so the militia responded by shooting the black prisoners. Those who were wounded in the earlier battle, uh, especially black militia members, were executed. And that killing just spread. By the time they finished, at least 150 black people were killed, including 50 who were murdered after the battle. Only three whites were killed, and a few were injured in the largely one-sided Battle of Colfax. On April 14th, the state militia under the control of the Republican Governor William Kellogg arrived at the scene and recorded the carnage. New Orleans police and federal troops also arrived in the next few days to reestablish order. Now listen carefully. A total of 97 white militiamen were arrested and charged with violation of the U.S. Enforcement Act of 1870, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. It made it illegal. Now, a handful of them were convicted, but dig this. They were eventually released in 1875 when the United States Supreme Court, in a case called United States v. Crookshank, ruled the Enforcement Act was unconstitutional. And the state of Louisiana never arrested anybody. Understand why this is, it was important. Um, the, the, the government 
had inst had uh, passed a law called the U.S. Enforcement Act of 1870. It said that it was illegal to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan or any terrorist group. Okay? So they prosecuted these people who had, who had massacred black people and they went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, well, here's the deal. The, <clears throat> the protections of the 14th Amendment did not apply to the actions of individuals but only to the actions of state governments. You hear that? Remember, we talked about the 14th Amendment a few minutes ago. But the Supreme Court decided that it didn't apply to actions of individuals, but only actions of state governments. So after that ruling, the federal government can no longer use the Enforcement Act of 1870 to prosecute actions by paramilitary groups such as the White League, which had chapters forming all across Louisiana beginning in 1874, and the White Knights of Camellia, as well as the Ku Klux Klan. And so they really got busy then. And that's why by 1877, they were able to end Reconstruction. And starting in roughly the late 1870s, you saw a rising of the Ku Klux Klan and other uh, terrorist organizations. You saw the Black Codes be um, instituted all across the South. You saw the lynching era began. And it began really to take back all of the gains we had made in the period of of radical reconstruction. You see, and that stayed that way for a long time until we got down to the uh, period, oh, I'll tell you, when, it, when we saw change. 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education. And that case opened up the door to reversing a lot of the racist um, things that were going on in the South, especially. Because what had happened was that in the South, let me have a sip of water. In the South, they had managed to strip away all of our gains. And with the lynchings, the black codes, etc. We were back in, in, in a, uh, well, as, as, as that uh, uh, documentary calls it, worse than slavery. Because, of course, we had the, um, the, the, the um, practices of putting us in jail. They call it the convict leasing program or the convict leasing system, where you could get locked up if you were black, and then farmers and miners could come and lease you from the county and make you work for them. And it was worse than slavery because in slavery, they owned the slaves. So they at least treated them with uh, uh, the idea of keeping them for as long as possible. With the convict leasing, they literally worked those convicts to death and then would go get some more because they didn't own them. And so whether it was farms, whether it was mines, whether it was um, turpentine farms, they used to make make them make turpentine, which was deadly. Make them work in the mines. So many black people got uh, died in mines in the South, um, and also building the railroads. See, they didn't use the they didn't use the Chinese to build the railroads going down south and up, uh, you know, north and south. They used the Chinese to build the railroads going west. They used convicts, people who have been convicted under convict leasing programs to build the railroads in the South. So 
They put us back in a different kind of slavery. The Supreme Court upheld that for years, for almost 100 years. And then there was some breakage, was starting with the, the um, education, Brown versus the Board of Education, where basically the Supreme Court said, well, you can't have separate but equal, because that that, that's what had occurred. They had said, okay, um, y'all can have your black schools over there, okay? But we ain't gonna have them blacks, uh, blacks, uh, blacks over here. All right, let me go real quick and go over this, these, some of these headlines, some of these news articles, because I really want this to be a part of the record here. New Orleans, April 15th. Bloody yeah. conflict. A large number killed and wounded. White and blacks arrayed against each other. The steamboat Southwestern, which arrived at 1.30 o'clock this afternoon, brings stirry and important news from Grant Parish. The whites have retaken Colfax, and there is not a Negro to be found for miles around. From passengers on the Southwestern, we glean the following. The Negroes had strongly entrenched themselves in the courthouse and built breastworks three or four feet high. There were, it is said, about 400 men armed and equipped thoroughly. On Sunday at about 12 o'clock, about 150 white men who had gathered from surrounding parishes, made an attack on the breastworks, and a brisk fight was kept up until somewhere. That's all I got on that one. Let me pull up another one. But you see how they, how the media was 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 working back then. Here's another one. Let's do this one. See what this one has. Grant Parish, the massacre, a most terrible one. Uh, escape of the whites, difficulty in sending off troops. Special dispatch to the New York Times, New Orleans, April 17th. Later news from the scene of hostilities in Grant Parish show that the massacre of the Negroes at Colfax Courthouse was even more horrible in all its details and more complete in its execution than was first reported. It now appears that not a single colored man was killed until all of them had surrendered to the whites who were fighting with them when over 100 of the unfortunate Negroes were brutally shot down in cold blood. It is understood that another lot of Negroes were burned to death in the courthouse when it was set on fire. The details of the massacre as they were related by eyewitnesses to the terrible scenes enacted at Colfax Courthouse, are positively appalling in their atrocity and would appear to be more like the work of fiends than that of civilized men in a Christian country. That's all I can really read on that one. I got one more. Let's see if we can glean from this next one. See, this is what should be in the history books. None of this is in the history books. Okay, last one. Oh, yeah, this is the bottom part of that. After the butchery of the uh, surrounded Negroes, the whites scattered in every direction, few of them going to their homes. Oh, oh, okay. In other words, the, the, the black people were scattered in every direction, few of them going to their homes. It is understood that many of them left for the Texas border in hopes of escaping the consequences of their crime. Oh, no, they're talking about the whites. As yet, no arrests have been made. Grant's Parish is over 200 miles, miles above the mouth of the Red River. And as there are very few boats leaving the city, the state authorities have experienced the utmost difficulty in getting suitable transportation to that region for the militia that has been ordered out to proceed thither. The federal troops, although ready to march today, could not procure any transportation whatsoever. Consequently, they cannot proceed to their destination, which is very unfortunate for the best interests of the states. 
Oh, man. Anyway, yeah, they, in other words, they couldn't get there till Monday, the day after the massacre. These troops buried over 60 bodies of colored men that had been found by them near the scene of the slaughter. That seems to have been the whole scope of their operations as all the whites participating in the battle had escaped before they arrived. So again, like I say, they eventually did arrest um, uh, some 97 white men, but they only prosecuted uh, they only prosecuted a few, and then those were eventually uh, released because the state, the, the United States Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. Whew. I come back to this map. I want you to look at it again. Because now, maybe, there may be a better understanding of what all this meant. Let's look at it. Let's start at the top, up here on the right. Cincinnati, 1884, 56 black people murdered. Again, the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan, 1865, 1866. Pulaski, Tennessee. Trenton, Tennessee, 1874. 400 whites massacred 16 blacks. Memphis, 1866, 46 blacks murdered, 90 hurt. Go over here to North Carolina, over on the right, 1890. Untold number of blacks killed and wounded by 400 white men. Wilmington, 1898, 22 blacks dead, and they ran the rest out of town and took over the government. Lawrence, South Carolina, 1870, 13 blacks dead. Hamburg, 1876, six, five blacks in custody shot in the back. Ellington, Georgia, 1876, 40 blacks slaughtered. Charleston, South Carolina, 500 whites race riot. Camilla, Georgia, 1868, seven black men murdered. Uh, murders by county in Florida. New Orleans, 1866, 34 murdered, over 200 injured. Thibodeau, 1877, massacred 300 blacks. Uh, Texas, 1865 to 1868, at least 373 blacks murdered by whites. Colfax, 1873, 280 blacks dead, 60 terribly mutilated. 34 shot through the head. Limestone County, Texas. So many blacks were murdered that vultures became a nuisance. Kushata, Kushata, 1874, 400 whites massacred blacks. Clinton, Mississippi, 1865, 50 blacks slaughtered. Vicksburg, 1874, 300 blacks murdered. Winston County, Mississippi, 1871. Every schoolhouse for blacks burned. Do you understand what this was about? This was during the time when we were supposed to be being protected, number one, so we could begin to have some kind of life after slavery. And if you understand how massive this was all across the South and all up there was no way we could build anything because every time we built something, they would burn it up. Now, this didn't even include Rosewood, and it didn't include later on out there in Oklahoma. Okay? They fought us tooth and nail every time, everything we were trying to do. And it's important, I think, this is why I say this should be taught in the schools. Because if it's understood that black people did their best to build with nothing, we didn't get no reparations. We built these things on our own and it scared them so bad that they decided to murder us, burn us out, kill us, rape us, pillage. Until they managed to force us back into worse than slavery.
I wanted us to have that understanding because too many times we're taught that, you know, we haven't really resisted and we were lazy and all of those things. And that's why we didn't get further. None of that's true. We worked, we built, we learned. And every time we would do it, they would burn us out, kill us, lynch us, rape us. Okay. And the state, the, the U.S. Supreme Court, I didn't even get to, what was it, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson? Go look that up. It's another important Supreme Court case. And so my great fear is that what we see going on today with the, the Supreme Court being literally turned upside down we're going to be dragged back a hundred years at least. And it's not a joke. What Trump is, is being allowed to do or being, uh, uh, you know, and they said it, he's changing the court. What'd you say, Clyde? Most of all, we survived. Yes, we did. And that's the thing that's, that gives me hope. We survived that. We're going to survive this, but it's going to cost us. See, this is the part that we didn't know how many times we were, we, and we still don't know about all the rebellions. See, rebellions are different from these massacres. So we had massacres on the one hand and rebellions on the other because we were fighting back tooth and nail. Okay? And so we're going to have to go through a similar kind of thing. I'm hopeful that we won't have as many massacres, but we actually have a massacre going on right now in some of these cities where the police are shooting our young men and they have managed to sicken enough of our young men, young black men, who are just angry, so angry that they shoot each other, shooting us. And that's why it's so, so, so bad because, see, that's not an accident. It ain't, you know, I asked this question, I'm going to close out. But I asked this question of some black people who have been calling for martial law and for the troops and National Guard to be sent into the city to get control of these ghettos where these Young thugs are just supposedly so rampant, they're just shooting people like dogs. That's the kind of rhetoric I hear. And I ask this question. I say, do you think that there's something inherently wrong with black people? Or if there's something inherently wrong with the system? And I use the word inherently very consciously. Now, there's some black people say, oh, yeah, there's something wrong with black people. I say, no, inherently wrong. Because inherently wrong means that you believe there's a flaw in us genetically. And that's what the eugenics movement was all about. That's what the Nazis were all about. They said there's something inherently wrong. And that's why they have to be what do they call it? The final solutions, the eugenics movement, the racists in this country, they believe that there's something inherently wrong with black people and therefore it's okay to kill us. They're not really human, you know. That's the danger of us not knowing our history. It's the danger of thinking that, that basically white folks will do the right thing. They have historically shown they will not just do the right thing. All right. Appreciate you. And um, of course, I'm going to close with no justice, no peace, no love, K-N-O-W.